I started to pubertize when I was aged fourteen and a half. There is an argument, depending on who you ask. For example, people who write biology textbooks and Wikipedia, that fourteen and a half years old is a little late to begin puberty. Most boys will begin pubertizing at eleven or twelve years old. They'll tell you, but I started, as I have mentioned, at age fourteen and a half. Those same textbooks, incidentally, will also tell you that the pubertistic process will finish around sixteen or seventeen years old. As you would guess, if you spent but a single afternoon in my company or watched a handful of my video arts, I bucked the trend and trod my own path. I finished my pubic journey mere weeks after my fifteenth birthday. In that brief six-month period, I grew five inches in height. My voice broke, nay, shattered. My speaking and singing voices dropping a full octave, and hair burst from my body like a SWAT team rappelling out of an office building. Puberty is a horror film. Never let anyone tell you any different. It was made even worse for me by mother flatly refusing to buy me more school clothes until the spring, forcing me to go through the entire winter with bitterly cold ankles and wrists. But the biggest change, the one that affected me most profoundly, was not an issue of my body, but of my mind. When it came to my brain, there was a new sheriff in town. And that sheriff's badge read Officer Waylon P. Testosterone. Male hormone coursed through my body like gale force winds blowing through a midwestern town. Winds so strong that were they real? A news team couldn't even send a poor reporter to stand out in them. As funny as that would be. And in doing so, the testosterone blew away all of my previous hobbies and interests. Photography, whoosh, gone. Short stories, rush, couldn't care less. Jelly sweets, whoa, blown into a tornado and flung into the road in the path of the hurricane chaser who's on the tail of this particular twister, probably played by somebody edgy like Aaron Taylor Johnson from that film with Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Not only did the testosterone destroy all of the hobbies and interests left in its wake, but it replaced them all with something. A singular focus that would dominate my life for the following decade. I, not me, liked girls now. And when I say girls, with no further specificity, for that six months, I mean it, with no further specificity. It was like my eyes had suddenly been covered with a soft focus filter, and a Hollywood lens, and beer goggles, all at once. Everyone was beautiful. Everyone. It was like living in Cape Side, Massachusetts, the home of Dawson's Creek. Nothing but hard tens everywhere I looked. I wanted to kiss them and rub them and marry them all. And these weren't new people. These were people I'd known for years: teachers at school, my nanny, mother's friends. I knew these people. I knew that they weren't gorgeous, and yet, somehow, they were. It was, in a word, terrifying. Like a volunteer being forced to debase himself at a hypnotism stage show, I found myself unable to trust my own senses to interact honestly with the world around me. Did she really smell like vanilla? Did her eyes really sparkle like a trickling stream? Did her hand really feel as soft as a bowl of flour? 
It was six months of confusion and abject paranoia. I kept myself in my room as much as possible, trying to avoid the possibility of finding the elderly South Asian woman who worked in the corner shop, Foxy. If I'd been invited to any parties in that time, it would have been really difficult to turn them down. But luckily I wasn't. And eventually, mercifully, the fog lifted. The villagers of my brain emerged from their homes once again, safe from the testosterocaine that had ripped their world apart. Things were back to normal. Everyone was as attractive as they actually were again. I was keen to get out into the world and experience human females face to face again. I looked around for somewhere to go and noticed that the school play was upcoming. What a perfect re-entrance into the social world of Oxford. Or so I thought. Then why are you trying to F him like a B, Brett? The 1995 school production of Pulp Fiction was a risky proposition for several reasons. Firstly, it was an adaptation written by Mr. Vivkery, the new drama teacher, and his skills as a playwright were largely untested. Secondly, the play was performed uniformly by teens not old enough to legally have seen the film in cinemas, and despite Mr. Vivkery's protestations, the head teacher therefore insisted that all of the curse words were replaced with their first initial, as with the preceding quote. And thirdly, because the film is a wonderfully diverse celebration of criminality of all races, but our school at that point had a sum total of two persons of colour, only one of which, Dixon Wu, had any interest in performing, being later cast as Marvin, the gunshot victim. But Mr. Vivkery was a maverick, and wanted to push the boundaries of what was possible dramatically in our school, which he did very successfully for two years, before being fired for encouraging and facilitating a 13-year-old to smoke on stage for an in-class monologue. However, in this instance, his rebellious instincts were vindicated, because the controversy got serious bums in serious seats, and his casting choices, including Lisa Townsend as Jules Winfield, were seen as bold and edgy. Now, I have to mention here, before anyone points it out, that yes, Lisa was and is Caucasian and the role of Jules Winfield was played so memorably in the film by Samuel L. Jackson, a black actor. However, for those upset about the whitewashing of the role, I remind you that this play was put on before whitewashing was a thing in the mid-1990s, so no need for consternation. Such was the clamour from the public to see this tale o crime in the hands of 16-year-olds. I only managed to get in to see opening night because of my friendship with Matthew Dilgris, one of the techies, and I'm glad I did. The show was powerful, vibrant, and had that unmistakable school play swagger. And whilst the entire cast were great, Lisa was spectacular. Her poise, her confidence, the way she flicked her hair when she told Naomi Fletcher that she was the tyranny of evil men. People were raving about her. I, however, was stricken with something other than admiration. Love. It knocked me for a loop. It really did. I had just spent six months purposely abstaining from female contact in order to control my indiscriminate affections, and now here I was going through the exact same thing. Walking out of the play, I looked around, desperately trying to make sense of the world again. I saw Mrs. Grabshaw, the German teacher, with her funny asymmetrical haircut, and I thought she was as unappealing as ever. Darren Fernsby's mother, notoriously unattractive, was present also, as was her big mole. Ms. Crundle, the English teacher, had also attended, and, whilst she was looking real good to me, 
She was a classic beauty, with piercing blue eyes that could set off sprinkler systems. My senses weren't lying to me. I was sure of it, which meant that my love for Lisa was real. And it was love, I knew that. As Dean Martin may well have sang had he been alive in a more sensually adventurous time. When you know you could happily strangle yourself to death with her beautiful auburn hair, that's amore. Without wishing to objectify her, I can tell you with confidence that Lisa earned full marks in every physical category, except maybe hands, which were a little too thin and looked like they might shatter if you squeezed them too tightly on a cold day. And that's not a big thing. It's easily remedied. I would simply make my first gift to her as her official boyfriend some stylish cashmere lady gloves. Problem solved. But in order to be her boyfriend, I needed to first ask her out. And when you're a 15-year-old in love looking to ask out a 16-year-old actress, where is the only appropriate place to do it? The pinnacle of teenage romance the cast party. The party was on a Saturday after the final performance, and the cast was in high spirits after another largely spotless performance. Thomas Spannell had said progeny when he'd meant to say prodigy in one of his lines as Winston Wolfe, but he'd carried it off with that classic Spannell panache, so you'd only have known if you were particularly familiar with the film dialogue. But not me. How were you able to get into the cast party, seeing as how you weren't in the cast? Don't you remember me talking about my sick hook-up with Matty Dilgris? He came through and how. Although it wasn't difficult to blend in because the party was happening at Grant Norris's house, which was so big he had two downstairs bathrooms. I had planned it all perfectly. The liberal application of yop aftershave, the navy blue waistcoat over a sky blue Ralph Lauren shirt tucked into my finest jeans, and my speech honed down to four tight romantic minutes, references to pulp fiction deftly woven in, but not so excessive that it seemed gimmicky. I saw her standing with four of her friends in the kitchen talking about whatever it is girls of sixteen like to talk about. She looked gorgeous in a big chunky jumper, her hair mostly tied up but with some key bits hanging down the side of her face like sashes on a beautiful four-poster bed. I knew there were too many friends there to approach so I needed to bide my time. I felt like a lion, stalking a herd of gazelle, waiting to pick one off as it strays from the rest. Which I actually think is a really positive, healthy feeling to have when it comes to interactions with the opposite sex. And then, my moment struck, as two of her friends sauntered off to dance to Two Can Play That Game by Bobby Brown. The adrenaline built in me. I knew this was my chance. I started walking towards her then froze, the magnitude of the moment getting to me. My nerves took control of me and forced me to grab a gas bill and a biro that were on a side table, scribble, would you like to go for lunch at Brown's tomorrow at one on the envelope, and thrust it into her hands. Her remaining friend, Gabrielle Martins, made some dig about me, which hurt a little, but luckily I had regressed into a silent, uber-focused state where the only people in the world were Lisa and I. Plus, Gabrielle's hair was looking quite greasy from the show, and so it wasn't like she was perfect or anything. As Lisa read the envelope, my legs became terrified and tried to leave of their own accord, but I punched them into submission because I'm a tough guy, which is, I'm sure, how I came across. I watched her sparkling, chocolate, Malteser-like eyes move across the message and then fix on me. This was it. The culmination of my young life. Her lips moved to speak. Okay, this was seriously it. A sound came out of her face. Oh my gosh, there was nothing more it than this. 
Sure thing. Two p.m. though, she said. And that was it. Lisa Townsend said yes to a date with me. I beamed a smile at her, nodded, curtsied for some reason, and melted back into the party, ready to have a rocking good time, which I did. The party was a hedonistic rave, much like the music video to Just Dance by Lady Gaga, but all fueled by teenage abandon, sugar, and I'll admit a smattering of illegal alcohol. I myself, whilst under age, remember, drank two alco pops and a swig of a Budweiser beer. I found, and I was flying. I felt like Christian Slater. It was debauched until eleven forty-five, when Grant's parents told us all to leave. Walking home from the cast party felt like I'd stepped into an old Hollywood musical, when the characters are so filled with emotion that they force the fabric of reality to warp, causing music, color, and highly trained dancers to manifest around them. Now, in my situation, the people waiting for the bus and the street cleaners and the tramps may have remained uninterested and uninvolved in my swooning and occasional light skipping, but the music and the colour were absolutely there because I felt them in my heart. I remember thinking, "I'm on cloud." Ten, which was more ecstatic than cloud nine by an entire cloud's worth. And why wouldn't I be? The most beautiful sixteen-year-old in Oxfordshire had agreed to go on a date with me. I'll write it again. The most beautiful sixteen-year-old in Oxfordshire had agreed to go on a date with me. It was a magical feeling. Even to this day, when I'm feeling down about something or other, as a visualization technique. I pretend that the most beautiful sixteen-year-old in Oxfordshire wants to go on a date with me, and just live in that feeling. It's powerful. I won't lie. That feeling carried me home, where I drifted to sleep, smiling at my ceiling and sniffing a handkerchief that Lisa had given to me with a spray of her perfume for me to keep her scent in my nostrils. In reality, of course, it was a handkerchief that I had purloined from my father and was using in lieu of the actual handkerchief that would surely be coming once Lisa and I were officially going steady. The following morning, however, I was stricken with panic because I had laid my rock and roll head on my pillow well after midnight. I had slept in until eleven a.m. to recuperate. I awoke at eleven. The date was at two. The Gene Kelly musical was now a distant memory, replaced by a taut race against time thriller starring Nicolas Cage, or if money's tight, Jason Patrick. I had three short hours to make myself presentable for Lisa Townsend, who was already out of my league on any normal day, even without the ego boost of a fantastically well-received theatrical run. I had my work cut out for me. After a piping hot seventeen-minute bath, I remember standing in Mother's bathroom, staring at her beauty products. They were legion, each with more exotic and unknowable ingredients than the last. I wanted to ask Mother for help in deciphering their purposes and properties, but the weekends were her time, and she didn't like to be disturbed. In the end, I felt a shotgun approach was the best idea, and combined a little dab from each into my palm, and proceeded to cover my face with the resultant compound. Once I'd used enough to comfortably cover my face, I saw that I still had the lion's share of the creamy amalgam in my hand. So I then covered my neck, then my shoulders, and in the end had covered the entirety of my torso in this kaleidoscopic concoction. I stood there, gazing at myself in the mirror, skin visibly glistening with moisture. I resembled a butter sculpture of myself, and looked ridiculous. I had to rub myself for a solid 
25 minutes to get my skin back to a matte finish, but at least I knew that were a kiss on the cards that afternoon, Lisa could press her lips on my skin anywhere north of the equator and be assured a soft landing. Once adequately moisturised, I spent probably too long picking out an outfit, eventually throwing on an Oxford cloth shirt, some chilled-out chinos, and a leather necklace to add just a suggestion of violence. Seeing I had only 35 minutes to go, I knew that I had to get a move on. Mother had been drinking and was in no fit state to drive, so I had to walk, grabbing a hand towel on the way out. My adrenaline turned the walk into a brisk canter, which got me there quicker, but elicited a lot of sweat thanks to my hyperhidrosis. Arriving early, I headed straight for the bathroom, whipped out my hand towel, and started dabbing. <laughs> this wasn't my first pre-dinner towel off. Later, I sat there in Brown's Restaurant, cornerstone of the local, not quite fine dining, but certainly better than Pizza Express restaurant scene, surveying the classy leather decor, trying to calm my heart, which was beating like a Phil Collins drum solo because of my nervousness and lack of cardio fitness from the canter. Now, Full disclosure, Brown's was a fancier restaurant than I could really afford at the time, but Mother had agreed to foot the bill for any activity I went on that got me out of the house for a few hours with at least one other person, so I had tried to impress with my choice of location. I knew, nervous though I was, that I had done all I could. I was at the restaurant, I was looking smart and feeling soft, and it was close to 2 p.m. Soon, Lisa Townsend, vision of delight, would walk into the restaurant. Genuinely incredible hair swishing this way and that, and the rest of my life could begin. But of course, she never came. After 45 long, tap-water-filled minutes of waiting, a waiter with great cheekbones brought me a single scoop of vanilla ice cream with a tweel. It was delicious and creamy and didn't make me feel any better. I left shortly afterwards after confirming for a third time that the ice cream was gratis, my mind a tornado of questions. Why didn't Lisa show up? Where was she? Was she okay? Had she been kidnapped? Was she dead in a ditch somewhere? Had she been run over by a Red North bus? Her final thought being, oh, I'm so annoyed I can't go on that date now. I didn't know. And the not knowing was terrifying. Now bear in mind, young people, this was before social media, or even the internet, or even mobile phones. I couldn't DM her, or email her, or text her, or even, and yes, I would have been desperate enough to even do this, phone her up and speak to her over the phone in a live phone conversation with another human being. Instead, I just had to half jog home with almost tears, almost streaming down my face, but not actually because I didn't cry, no matter what any so-called eyewitnesses might say. I sat in a hot tub of confusion and isolation all evening, feeling a very alone. I could barely concentrate on Scylla Black's effortless banter with the contestants on Blind Date that night, and normally I ate that up like doughnuts. The following morning at school, I felt very much like a unicorn in a room full of horses, which is a great analogy. Picture yourself as a unicorn for a moment, won't you? Now, a unicorn is better than a horse. We all know that. You know it. I know it. Deep down, even horses know it. But the fact is, there are more horses than unicorns, so horses make the rules of what's in and what's out. And regardless of how magical you are or how good you are at flying, at the end of the day, you're a freak with a big spike of bone and keratin sticking out of your noggin. Let me tell you, that Monday morning after I'd been stood up by Lisa Townsend, I felt like a unicorn. 
and everyone was staring at my face bone. No one said anything directly to me, but it was just a feeling, you know? Even Matthew Dilgris wasn't as friendly as he usually was. There was no smile, no quote from The Crow, the film that formed the spine of our friendship. Just a wave. And bear in mind, he was a techie, and therefore wasn't overburdened with friends. So for him to be avoiding me, the situation had to be bad. But why? What did people know about me? What had changed? And then the sad, sick truth dawned on me. It was Lisa. She hadn't been murdered or kidnapped or forbidden from attending the date because her father didn't approve of my ways. She wasn't innocent. This was all a big game to her, toying with the emotions of a guy a full year her junior who'd left it all out there when he'd asked her out via gas bill. He had been so courageous, and she knew just how to turn his courage against him, say yes to his innocent, heartfelt question, and then deliberately not show up. Deliberately, as in, it was deliberate. This angel of whom i dreamt for eleven straight nights in fantasies of varying logic and lewdness, was in reality a demon, a succubus sent to prey on earnest, confused young men and then tell the whole school about it so that they could all have a good laugh. It was very distressing to take in. I'm sure many of you will be screaming at young me to go and confront her, right? Get all up in her grill and tell her off for being mean. But in my experience, confrontation generally leads to arguments. And who wants an argument when it's possible that someone will say something really nasty to you about something you're already fairly self-conscious about? <laughs> Not me. No, I made the decision to avoid her at all costs for the rest of my life, and if in the future I had any more romantic dreams about her, I'd see them through to completion, but afterwards I'd just revel in the exquisite tragedy of them and get all mopey and introspective. Maybe get some poems out of it all. Goodbye, Lisa Townsend. Yeah, you got one over on me. But that was over. But then, at lunchtime... With me sat under a tree eating some derily triangles, confrontation found me. I saw her on the horizon, walking toward me, arms folded. She was wearing a really nice cardigan, and her hair was plaited in a single chunky plait that cascaded down her left side. Damn, she looked amazing. I wanted a big hole to swallow me up and drag me away from all this, or, even better, to swallow her up. But still, she approached. And with every step she took, more and more people gathered round to watch. Of course they did. They were the audience, and this was the denouement, the final punchline in my humiliation. She stopped about six feet away from me, I didn't get up to greet her. It was the most impolite thing I could think of. A first blood to me. Hey, where were you yesterday? she asked. I was confused. She knew exactly where I was. She was probably hiding in the kitchen with all her friends laughing at me. Browns, I replied. I didn't see you there, she said, brow furrowed. She seemed like she was genuinely confused. Just like a great actress would if they were trying to seem like they were genuinely confused. I was on to her, and I think she knew it. I was on the table by the toilets because I didn't ask for a table with enough bass in my voice like my father does. Her face scrunched up, trying to work something out, and then opened up like a beautiful rose. I tried not to fall in love again. Did you go to Brown's, the restaurant? I thought you meant Brown's house, Toby Brown. We'd all arranged to go there for lunch because he's got a really big garden and his mum's never around. I thought you knew. That's why you'd asked about it. She really was a phenomenal actress. That speech sounded like it was absolutely what had happened. 
And using Toby Brown was clever, because he was actually known as Brown because of the surfeit of Tobys there were in her year. It all checked out. But I knew better than to trust a thespian. I decided that it would be more effective to show her that I wasn't buying it rather than tell her by turning an intense shade of red, especially on the cheek area. Red means no, Lisa. I ain't buying it. Read my cheeks. I'm really sorry. That's terrible. I hope you weren't waiting for long. She just wouldn't let it go. Rip my heart out again, why don't you? I shrugged, as nonchalantly as I could, which was way easy because I was incredibly, painfully ambivalent about the whole thing. Okay, well, I really am sorry, she said, meekly. Well, you've had your fun now, Lisa. You've earned a good laugh at my expense with all your friends. But if there isn't any more to add, please leave me to my cheese slices and bugger off, my nod seemed to say. And she did, turning and walking away, giving me one final look at her spellbinding hair plait swinging back and forth. I saw my peers talking amongst themselves, probably about me being an idiot. I saw her friends, including the infamous Brown, asking her what that was all about, as if they didn't already know. And I saw Heather Bateman, my bully, laughing and swearing at me, flicking the V. She'd been able to taunt me for six months about the time I once accidentally walked into the wrong classroom, so I knew she'd be dining out on this story for a long time. But ultimately, and be prepared to be shocked, I'm not bitter about what happened between Lisa Townsend and I, because she, inadvertently, has shaped who I am today. In that moment, with the eyes of the nation upon me, I made a decision that if I was to be the talk of the town, it would be for positive things. I will always be a unicorn. I can't help that. I draw attention wherever I go. But I will be famous for all the right reasons. And that is a path I still tread on to this day, incredible as it is that I'm still not famous. So to Lisa, I say only thank you. Honestly, you guys, I'm the bigger man here. I wish her a lifetime of creative success. I wish her a happy marriage. And I wish her a return to having hair as rich, full and autumnal as it was when she was 16. All things, incidentally, that I know from social media stalking, she has yet to achieve. You are.